some of that spreading further north into France and Germany on Wednesday. Then we see things easing a little across northern Europe in terms of the temperatures through Thursday and Friday. High pressure means a lot of fine weather across Western Europe. Those temperatures in the north though just ease as we see this weak cold front really nothing more than a band of cloud drifting its way south through Thursday. But after 37 perhaps in Paris on Wednesday, 32 on Thursday. But I do anticipate that heat will come surging up from the south, from Iberia in to the north of France and the UK as we look further ahead into our forecast with potentially a few spots seeing records challenged here. For South America, it's a different story. It's much colder air feeding in to Chile and unsettled air um, weather as well. A lot of snow across the Andes already, more to come in the next few days and these fronts pushing a fair way north. Now it's some positive news for Santiago, always so frequently affected by severe drought. We've already seen a month's worth of rain for July fall here in recent days. There's some more to come in the days ahead as the picture stays rather unsettled. We've even seen some rain in the Atacama Desert and there may be more here too. I want to talk to you about the politics of this. Did she not think she was going to get that question? It's important to remember that this is a negotiation. It's a good photo of I have an opportunity to create chaos. There is always an email. We are so insignificant in this cosmos. Do you want some facts on baguettes? I'm just feeding you the stories. Maybe this is The Context. News. In-depth. The Context with Christian Fraser on BBC World News. Prices are rising across the globe, sending the cost of living soaring. So why is this happening and what does it mean for you? The war in Ukraine seems a long way away from this beach in South Shields, but the soaring price of potatoes, fish, oil, the energy to cook them is in part due to that conflict. It's causing a cost of living and a cost of doing business emergency. But it's not just about food. Tourism, which is a lifeline to the Egyptian economy, is likely to be hit hard too. Around 40% of tourists who visit Egyptian sea resorts come from Russia and Ukraine. Before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Zimbabwe was already battling a double-digit inflation, and these price increases are likely to worsen the economic outlook. The surge in energy prices and inflation, a global phenomenon affecting the entire world. Business on the BBC. Make the connection. Michelle Flurry in Washington, and this is BBC World News America. At the seventh public hearing, the committee investigating the storming of the US Capitol lays out how President Trump incited extremists in a last ditch bid to remain in office. Tensions in the West Bank. Palestinian militant groups are on the rise as Israel increases its military raids. Four-time Olympic champion Mo Farah reveals he was trafficked into the UK as a child and forced to work as a domestic servant. And the first extraordinary images from NASA's new telescope. Distant galaxies and light from 13 billion years ago that have left scientists speechless. There's so much room for improving our understanding of how star formation works and how the distant universe looks just um, from these few images. Welcome to World News America on PBS and around the globe. On Capitol Hill here in Washington today, the January 6th committee sought to show that Donald Trump was the central figure that set everything in motion and that he should be held responsible. Congresswoman Liz Cheney also spoke of how the former president is still trying to exert his influence, trying to reach out directly to a witness we haven't yet heard from. After our last hearing, President Trump tried to call a witness in our investigation. A witness you have not yet seen in these hearings. 
That person declined to answer or respond to President Trump's call and instead alerted their lawyer to the call. Their lawyer alerted us. And this committee has supplied that information to the Department of Justice. And for the first time, we heard from a defendant who faced criminal charges for taking part in the attack on the Capitol, who spoke about how he was directly influenced by the president at the time, as well as a former member of the Oath Keepers who described the right-wing extremist group as a dangerous militia. Our correspondent, Nomia Iqbal, has been following the hearing. Nomia, uh, Liz Cheney was at pains right from the start of the hearing to say that he was uh, a man in his 70s, not sort of some kind of young ingenue, and that he was able to be held responsible. I mean, what else stood out to you, and how did they kind of prove their, their case here? That's right. So the hearing was split into two. So in the first part, we heard from Pat Cipollone, which was a really significant witness, former White House counsel to Donald Trump, really good get for the committee. They really wanted him to speak. And he talked about how in mid-December, so this was about December the 18th, there had been a meeting between Donald Trump's advisers and these, this group of unofficial advisers. So his official advisers wanted him to concede the election, to say, look, it's over, you lost. But his unofficial advisers were saying, no, keep pushing the baseless claims of election fraud. And Mr. Cipollone described how there was this huge like, fight, an argument in the White House, and uh, aides have described it as an unhinged meeting. But the next day, Donald Trump did tweet uh, to say uh, to his supporters, there's going to be a protest on January the 6th, and he said, be there will be wild. So this goes into the second part of the hearing in which the committee says that was a siren call to extremist groups like the Oath Keepers, like the, the Proud Boys, who turned up at Capitol Hill. So what the committee is trying to show is that the riots that happened on January the 6th weren't just spontaneous, they were organized, that they, there was organization to it, and they say that Donald Trump is responsible for it. But trying to prove legal culpability is really, really hard for them to prove, and the impeachment managers tried to do it at the impeachment trial of Donald Trump, which in which he was acquitted. But that is what they have been trying to achieve today in this hearing. Uh, and just to pick up on, on Liz Cheney's point at the end, right at the very end of the hearing, sort of almost kind of as an afterthought, uh, she dropped that news that, that the former president had reached out to uh, a witness we haven't yet heard from. That's right. I think you could probably infer that it might be someone that he knows. What's been quite extraordinary about the, the hearing so far is that we're hearing from not Democrats. We're hearing from those who were part of his inner circle, like Pat Cipollone. Uh, we've heard from William Barr, who was his attorney general. Even his eldest daughter, Ivanka Trump, has given evidence as well. Uh, so Donald Trump obviously completely dismisses the hearings. He's called it a partisan witch hunt. And he's described the panel, which is made of uh, seven Democrats and two Republicans, as nothing but a panel of thugs and hacks. Nomia Iqbal there for us on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Well, President Joe Biden is travelling to Israel for a series of meetings there and in the West Bank before heading to Saudi Arabia. His visit comes as Israel has been carrying out military arrest raids in the occupied West Bank this week, a near daily occurrence since a wave of deadly attacks by Palestinians against Israelis in the spring. Dozens of Palestinians have been killed during army incursions this year, with the UN's Human Rights Office raising concerns over excessive force and possible collective punishment, accusations rejected by Israel. The focus has been on the city of Jenin, where Palestinian militant groups have been rearming, as our Middle East correspondent Tom Bateman reports. <laughs> A mother's grief echoes around the grave of her daughter. You burned my heart, she says. I didn't believe you'd be buried before me. Hanan was hit by a bullet as she headed home from an English class, one among dozens of Palestinians killed in the West Bank this year. When the taxi driver saw the Israeli army deployed, he asked the girls to duck. The bullet hit her here. It left five holes in her body. Her schoolwork, full of promise for her family, now all they have left are the fragments of a life and few answers about her death. 
As long as there is occupation, there are stories like Hanan's, and every day there is a story. Hanan's taxi was hit during an Israeli army raid into Jenin. There were gunfights with militants. The army says it is examining the case. It's not clear how the vehicle was struck. As the raids have stepped up, rights groups accuse Israel of using excessive force. The army says it doesn't intentionally target civilians and they respond to a lethal threat. It follows a series of deadly attacks by Palestinians. This was Tel Aviv in April. A gunman opened fire at a packed bar, killing three Israelis. It was one in a string of attacks in which 18 people were killed. Israelis were facing the worst spate of violence on their streets in years. Meanwhile, in Jenin refugee camp, the militants have been rearming. Shows of force on a scale not seen in two decades. There's a huge amount of weapons, M16s, automatic uh, assault rifles. It's like people are letting loose. It really feels like, and you can hear that, things are ramping up because of the situation at the moment. We were taken to the home of the so-called Jenin Brigade. It's part of the Palestinian armed groups, all listed by Israel and the West as terrorist organizations. But in the camp, their recruits are growing. We go out as armed resistance in the camp. When we find the soldiers, we shoot at them. The West sees groups in the camp as terrorist organizations. So why are you doing this? Why don't you leave it to the official Palestinian Authority? The Palestinian Authority sold us out from the beginning. We don't see them as brothers. They allow the Israelis to raid Nablus and Ramallah. They don't protect us. They want to wipe out the resistance. During a raid in May, the veteran Palestinian journalist Shireen Abu Akleh was killed. Evidence suggests she was hit by an Israeli bullet, something the army disputes. Her case has become a symbol for Palestinians. These raids are happening so frequently now that much of the time they're just simply not well documented. So when a journalist like Shireen is killed, you simply see the risk, the dangers involved. The same month, an Israeli officer was shot dead in Jenin. There's been no let up in the raids and many fear a further descent into violence. <laughs> Hanan, I can't reach you, her mum cries. Her daughter tried to get to a class and never came home. Just having hope here meant paying with her life. <laughs> Tom Bateman, BBC News, Janine. One of the top leaders of the so-called Islamic State group has been killed in a US drone strike in northwest Syria. According to the Pentagon, Maha al-Agal has been trying to develop ISIS networks outside of Syria and Iraq. One of his top aides was also injured in the strike. Four-time Olympic champion runner Samo Farrow has revealed he was trafficked into the UK as a child and forced to work as a domestic servant. He told the BBC he was born Hussein Abdi Kahin, but was given the name Mohammed Farah by those who flew him from East Africa with fake documents. He previously said he came to the UK from Somalia with his parents as a refugee. The BBC's community affairs correspondent Adina Campbell has the story. One of the defining moments of the London 2012 Olympics. Samo Farah on Super Saturday. Taking gold in the 10,000 metres. Part of a record-breaking career, cementing his place in the history books. But life could have turned out to be very different, and we now know he's not who we think he is. Most people know me as Mo Farah, but it's not my name or... It's not the reality. The real story is I was born in Somaliland, north of Somalia, as Hussein Abdi Kahin. In a new documentary, he also reveals he was a child slave, trafficked to the UK at the age of nine and forced to work for a family in West London. My job was to look after those kids, shower them, cook for them, clean for them, and she said, if you ever want to see your family again, 
Don't say anything. If you say anything, they will take you away. Often I would just lock myself in the bathroom and cry and nobody's there to help. So after a while I just you know, learn not to have that emotion. Despite what was happening behind closed doors, Mo Farah was a cut above the rest during his teenage years. And it was a conversation with his PE teacher who helped him escape from the abuse at home. And years later, the documentary captures the moment he's reunited with his mum, who he thought had died. My mum's name is Aisha. I'll never forget my mum on that tape. So the tape had a number on it, like say, or oh, call cool, on the back of it. This is the number. And then I remember he said, if this is a bother or causing you trouble, don't, just leave it. You don't have to contact me. And I'm going, I mean, no, of course I'm going to contact you. And at that point, that's when I first called my mum. Samo says he's made this documentary to tell the world what really happened in his childhood and to shed light on this serious issue of modern slavery, to show people greatness can be achieved even after monumental trauma. Adina Campbell reporting on the Olympians' astonishing personal journey. Well, in other news, the UN Security Council has voted to allow cross-border aid deliveries to millions in rebel-held Syria from Turkey for six months after intense diplomatic wrangling. The US, the UK and France had wanted to extend the aid for another year, a proposal which Russia vetoed. Charities have accused the Security Council of failing the children in the region by agreeing only to a short-term extension. A petition in Ukraine to legalise same-sex marriage has gained enough signatures for the president to have to consider the proposal. 28,000 people signed the petition, meaning President Zelensky now has 10 days to respond. Same-sex relationships are legal in Ukraine, but same-sex marriages are not recognised. The war in Ukraine has highlighted certain rights disparities between married couples compared to those in same-sex relationships. And London's Heathrow Airport has told airlines to reduce the number of tickets they sell for the remainder of the summer months in order to cope with the rebound in air travel. The airport is limiting the number of daily passengers who can depart to 100,000, 4,000 less than scheduled. It follows widespread travel disruption in the UK as the industry deals with staff shortages. Now, at the beginning of this month, Sierra Leone re-denominated its currency by removing three zeros in a bid to reduce the amount of notes in circulation. The cost of food and services, uh, like in many parts of the world, are steadily increasing. In addition, fuel prices continue to rise, which is making the cost of living high. As is at Ola Olua reports. Raymond is a university student in Freetown. He has two jobs and shares an apartment with a friend. I'm a driver and I'm also a teacher. What is the amount? 5,000 euros. He is struggling to make ends meet and the rising cost of living is having a huge impact. The price of food alone has more than doubled in the last six months. How much is the sardine? Sardine 10,000. We used to buy 10,000 euros. Yes. But now the cost of, of living is not easy. 10,000 leones, the local currency is less than one US dollar. Six months ago, you could buy three tins of sardines for the same price. What I'm making is not enough. It's not enough for my schooling, it's not enough for my sustainability. Raymond, like many other Sierra Leoneans, is feeling the impact of the high cost of living. Sierra Leone imports most of its staple foods like yam and granite oil. Despite having a large agricultural sector that centers on rice, corn and sweet potato, they are not self-sufficient. $200 million is spent annually on rice imports alone. Civil war, Ebola and the COVID-19 pandemic made a big impact on the Sierra Leone's economy over the past 20 years. The cost of living is high. 
and the inflation rates jumped from 22% to around 25% in just a month. It's not just the price of food that has gone up. The government increased the price of fuel four times since February. This has led to a rise in the cost of transportation, food items and other services. Economists are concerned. The Soil Union economy is a standstill economy. It's an economy that uh, needs a push, needs a change, needs a change of policies. It's difficult for people in this country. For me, I looked at them as a magician. The government is embarking on a series of measures in order to mitigate the current situation. They have also launched an agricultural program to make the country become more self-sufficient. Azizat Olalua, BBC News. The first images from the world's most advanced telescope, the James Webb Telescope, have been released, providing the clearest, deepest and most detailed images of the universe we have ever seen. Now, the images were presented to the world by NASA, the European and the Canadian space agencies today, and they contain light from galaxies that has taken billions of years to reach ours. As our science editor, Rebecca Morell, reports. The beauty of our universe, as never seen before, captured by the James Webb Space Telescope. These are the cosmic cliffs of the Carina Nebula. Amidst the dust, stars are being born. This is a new view of Stefan's Quintet, 300 million light years away, where vast galaxies are caught in a celestial dance. And the deepest ever view of space, it's teeming with galaxies, some from just a few hundred million years after the dawn of the universe. To have worked on a mission for this long, to be able to finally see it come to fruition, to do what it's supposed to do, is just, it's absolutely incredible. The images are amazing themselves, just as images, but the hint of the detailed science we're gonna be able to do, of what we're gonna be able to learn from these images is what makes me so excited. The telescope blasted off last year on Christmas Day, and over the last six months, it's been getting ready for its mission. The James Webb Space Telescope is an engineering marvel. At its core is a six and a half meter wide mirror made up of 18 hexagonal segments, each perfectly aligned to act as a single surface. It also has a sun shield the size of a tennis court to protect it from the heat and light of the sun. The telescope will look back further in time than ever before, showing us the light from the very first stars to shine. We'll also be able to see how they came together to form the earliest galaxies. And it will study other planetary systems, revealing whether life could exist beyond our world. It's almost like a time machine. You're looking back into the far distant past. And so we can begin to answer those questions, such as how did the first galaxies and stars formed. I mean, the hope with this telescope is we see sort of almost in real time, as it were, a history of the universe playing out. The telescope also captured this 2,000 light years away. It's a star going through its death throes. In some strange way, we're, you know, it's a pretty view of something decaying and dying. But we're able again to look at that material as it flows away from the star and understand something about the evolution of the star. So going from star birth in the star forming regions all the way through to star death. But this is just the start for the telescope. Over the coming days and months, more and more images will be captured. Our knowledge of the universe and our place in it is about to be transformed. Rebecca Morell, BBC News. Well, for more on this extraordinary feat of science, I spoke earlier to Torsten Boker. He is a scientist from the European Space Agency who has worked on the James Webb Telescope for the last 20 years. Torsten, thank you so much for joining us on this historic day. The images are spectacular, but I can't imagine what it must feel like for you, having worked on this for, for several decades now. What was your first thought when you saw some of these first images? First thoughts were, you know, immense gratitude, pride and joy to, to see things come together so wonderfully. I mean, we always knew that James Webb would be revolutionary and it would be fantastic as a new tool for astronomers. But to see the images in all their beauty and all their glory um, 
was was really nice because it also was the first time for me to see them. They were, you know, NASA kept this very close and um, almost secret. So we didn't really have much advance warning. So seeing them this morning was, yeah, just blew, took my breath away, um, to, to be honest, um, because um, they did also a fantastic job in, in creating depth and um, three dimensionality in those images. So for astronomers um, and me, um, it was it was a great, great day. I mean, this is such a huge breakthrough. Explain the significance and also what did it take to get here? Well, today, of course, marks both the end of something and the beginning of something. It's the end of 20 years of and more for some people of, of design, development, testing and retesting of this very, very complex observatory. and. Um, seeing it work as well as it does um, is, is fantastic news for all of us and it marks the end of that phase of the mission but simultaneously and, and that, that's mostly for the engineers really who, who now can move on to other things because they have done their job. As a scientist um, it also marks the start of a new phase because now the scientific exploitation um, begins and I very much look forward of using this telescope also for my own research but um, just seeing the, the, the amazing potential, um, it is really hard to put into a few words um, the richness of, of just those few images that we've seen today. Um, I Personally, I think there's room for hundreds of scientific papers just in those um, few um, images. And if, if people get the time to analyze and, and, and really clean up the spectra and, and make sure they really understand, there's so much discovery space just in those few images. It is really hard to put into words. And I mean, when we look back at the Hubble telescope, when that first came, those early images uh, blew us all away. And yet the important discoveries actually came from later images. I think that's kind of that point you're trying to make. This is the end of something, but the beginning of something else. Yeah, I mean, so you have to remember that these images were not taken for their scientific value, really. They were taken mostly to demonstrate that everything works, and they also were selected for their visual appeal. Um, but, and that is a real surprise to me, I think the scientific content in even those few images that were really not taken over much time, um, is, is tremendous. You can see that from the image behind you. If uh, anywhere you look, you find details that we have never ever seen before. And we, you know, there's so much room for improving our understanding of how star formation works and how the distant universe looks just um, from these few images. So it, it really whets the appetite for what's to come over the next years. And, and the potential for habitable planets going forward. Torsten Booker, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this very special day. And back here on Earth, a sporting star has re-entered Washington's orbit. That is English legend Wayne Rooney. He has returned to the U.S. capital to become the new manager of the D.C. United Major League Soccer team. That's three years after he left. Thank you for watching World News America. Goodbye. Hello. Heatwave conditions are set to persist across Siberia in the days ahead. Temperatures in excess of 40 degrees for Spain and Portugal. For Wednesday, some of the heat pushing into northern France as well, though, and across towards Germany. But notice this pool of cooler air further east across Europe, sitting underneath an area of low pressure. That's going to drop some further heavy rain on Wednesday and pull quite a cool northerly wind uh, down across Finland. Some below average temperatures and wet weather to come in Helsinki. Turkey, fine. A lot of sunshine around here, perhaps just a few showers to the north adjacent to the Black Sea. We could see the odd isolated but heavy thundery downpour affecting Greece on Wednesday. Head further west, though, and we're underneath the core of high pressure and sitting in all of that heat across Spain and Portugal. Temperatures up to 37 degrees in Paris. Notice, if you will, though, that it is somewhat cooler across northwestern Europe. This line of cloud here is actually the remnants of a cold weather front, and that just pulls some slightly fresher air into the likes of uh, Paris and Berlin for Thursday, but still that heat stays locked in place towards the southwest. And then there's signs as we go further ahead into the period that we're going to tap into a southerly airstream that pulls the heat back into Paris and London through the weekend and into the beginning of next week. It stays relatively cooler further east, but temperatures will start to lift as that low pressure clears.
I've reported on health and medicine for the BBC for around 30 years, and that's taken me around the world, looking at global disease threats and innovations in medicine. These girls are benefiting from a vaccine which is offered routinely in wealthier countries. I first became aware of this new coronavirus in early 2020. This has been such a fast-moving story and was relentless. Some of the images I've seen in intensive care units, they will stay with me forever. The warning signs here couldn't be clearer. The NHS is now on the brink. There's been a wealth of information about the disease, about vaccines, about how the virus is transmitted. And it's my role as medical editor to put that clearly and succinctly for the audience. It is hard to overstate just how important this vaccine could be. It was always clear that vaccines would be our route out of the pandemic. So it was a privilege to be able to film the very first volunteers to receive one of the vaccines during the trials. Ultimately, it is science we have to thank for giving us this route out of the pandemic. Coronavirus is going to be with us for years and years. We're going to have to learn how to live with it, but hopefully we'll not see our lives dominated by it. Upgrading or migrating your Oracle or SAP software can waste resources. Instead, join over 4,000 clients who've already made the switch to Ramini Street. Other companies do software, we do support. Rimini Street. This is a residential building. There's a real sense that the danger, the conflict is coming closer and a feeling here now that nowhere is safe. Страшно, когда мины летят, кто его знает, там в огороде у нас взрывалось. И этот свист еще до сих пор в ушах. On February the 24th, everything changed. A man who turned to politics just three years before was now facing down the world's second most powerful army. Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In-depth programming on BBC World News. Muya was a hell. Behind every headline. I had this feeling that I'm entering a prison. There is a human story. <laughs> this is our world. I just seen the cops kill somebody. They were treating me as if I was the suspect. A series of documentary films that reveal the human drama at the heart of global events. If I'm in jail, I'm living my life meaningfully. To urge the world to keep focus on what's happening in Hong Kong. I've got to accept where I'm at and not let it get me down. Our mind and the unity we have. There's the powerful things in the world. Our world. This weekend on BBC World News. I understand the consequences of my decision. And one of the consequences of my decision was not going to Australia, and I was prepared not to go. Journalists are under attack in ways that we've never experienced before. I bring that part of my Asian culture with me into everything I do. They can kill us, and they will also die. I can't understand for what. When big names talk, they talk to the BBC. On BBC World News, Hard Talk asks tough questions in interviews with people who are shaping the news. Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. The fractures in American society are widening over guns, abortion, education and more. But the deepest, most traumatic fracture is surely over race and it impacts all of the others. The US is post-slavery, post-segregation, but definitely not post-racism. My guest is Ibram X. Kendi, an influential writer and academic who argues the only way to not be racist is to be 
actively anti-racist, a message he says children must hear. Is his approach bound to intensify America's internal conflict?